Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Right. So another beautiful Egyptian flag there for you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, <laughs> Seth. <laughs> so, so this is another talk about scaphoid, uh, about scaphoids now. And again, there's not much evidence. This is just 22 years of being a consultant fixing lots of scaphoids. Um, so I, I, I thought maybe I can just teach you some things about mending a scaphoid bone. And we'll talk about the guide wire, the, the screw, the wires, little proximal pole fractures, the humpback deformity, and using a, a latest thing, which is a scaphoid plate. Now the guide wire has to be accurate because when we fix scaphoids, by and large now, we use screws with cannulation. And I'll show you some things about this. Now, the first thing is if, you, if you're putting a wire across a scaphoid, in fact, if you're putting a wire across a distal radius fracture for that matter, many other things, you can save lots of radiation and lots of time and lots of unnecessary skin perforation by this very, very simple technique, which is you have your image intensifier machine and you put the wire over the skin, all right? And then when it's in the perfect position, like in the top right here, you then mark the skin with a pen. And from now on, one of your difficult views is you forget it because there it is, you've marked it already. So now you only have to think about the other second angle for this fixation. So that's a very, very simple trip, uh, uh, tip for you. You can use it for other bones too. The next thing is when you put these screws in, you want the screw to be right down the middle of the scaphoid. And it's quite difficult to get to that point because the trapezium is in the way. And when you put these screws in, it's okay to put your guide wire across a little bit of the trapezium here and drill across the edge of the trapezium so that actually your screw is right down the middle of the scaphoid like it is here because the trapezium has got a big joint surface. And if you take just a little bit where your screw went through, it can carry that load. It's not a, not a big deal, but it gets your screw where it needs to be, which is in the strong part of the scaphoid. The other thing is, is that the scaphoid is a round bone and can rotate a bit like this. And when you put your screw in and start to tighten the screw up in young guys who've got very very strong bone you can find that when you put the screw in there's a danger of actually twisting a bit so it is okay to put a wire a second wire across so as you're screwing in it stops the system from moving and actually with a fine wire there's no reason if it's in a perfect place as a second wire to keep the wire forever now, another trick is to be careful you don't break the guide wire because these guide wires are very thin and they can break. You've got to be very, very careful you don't break them. And one of the problems is, is that when you're drilling, the drill can be at an angle on the wire like I've drawn here. And you need to be very careful. So as you're putting these in under the X-ray beam, if you feel any sort of stopping, you must just stop drilling, look at the x-ray beam and make sure that the drill hasn't moved relation in relation to the wire, okay? Um, look both ways. And you can see here how the wire is being bent. And if you keep drilling, you can, the, the, the drill will burn the wire and it'll heat it up and break. So be careful. Now, the other thing is, is to make sure the screw is in the middle of the bone. And I really, really, really want you to make sure that when you do your x-rays on the table, having put your guide wire in and your screw in, you take these two views. So of course you have a PA and of course you have a lateral, but you need to also do these two views here, which is a supinated oblique on the left and a pronated oblique on the right. Now, if you do those two views, you can see that screw is perfect. It's right down the middle of the bone but you'll be surprised you think on these AP and lateral view that it looks great. And then you do a supinated view and you do a pronated view and you think, oh, whoops, the screw's not in a good place. So always make sure that you have those two views. And you can see here how I've left the second wire in uh, to stop it rotating. Probably that was a wire I put in in a bad position, 
but you can leave that in and use that as a guide to recognize where the next one goes. You can leave them in. So those two views are essential to make sure that your wire and your screw are where they should be. Now, if you have a fracture in the proximal third, then really you should put your screw in from dorsally. So I always put the screw in from the front if it's the, the waist of the scaphoid. But when it's proximal, it's, you need to get the grip better in that smaller bone. And for these ones, then you need to go from the back. And I don't put a guide wire through the skin at the back because there's all these tendons in the way. I actually make a little incision at the back and just retract. And you can see the proximal pole of the scaphoid. And your guide wire has to go actually at the edge of the scaphalunate ligament to get through there. So proximal pole fractures you fix from the back. Now, how do you choose what screw to use? Now, I think this is important. Uh, when I was a junior and I read papers where people say you need to put the biggest, fattest screw you can into the scaphoid. Why would that be? Well, because a strong bone and a strong screw and a big screw. But that's silly. That is really silly because bone has got the same rules as anything else, which is pi r squared. And so the diameter of the bone is proportional to the, 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 to the square of the circumference. So the problem you've got is if you put in a big fat screw like I've done on the left hand side, there's less bone. And we all know the problem with scaphoid is biology. It's biology. So if you put a big fat screw in, there's less bone. And if there's less bone, it's less likely to heal. And we know this. And in fact, if you look at the literature, fixing a scaphoid with two or three wires has got the same union rate, if not better, but the same union rate as using screws. You don't need compression. Compression is not needed in a scaphoid. It just needs to be stable and you just need to have good biology. So use a thin screw. And any of these modern screws are very, very strong. You don't need a big screw in a small bone like a scaphoid. So thinner screws, stability is more important than strength. Stability is more important than compression. And in fact, if you compress too much, you'll, you'll damage the bone by having pressure necrosis in the bone. Or if you have a graft, you'll damage the graft by crushing the graft. And if you have compression, you can keep going and then the screw becomes too long and then sticks out into the joint. So for me, I always use the smallest micro screw. I don't use bone graft early on. Uh, most scaphoids early will heal without a bone graft. Um, also, if you've used a small screw and for some reason the bone doesn't heal, you could always then next time put bone graft around and use the bigger screw in the hole um, and get better grip. So don't use wide screws, use thin, thin screws. And the other thing is use a long screw. So here's a proximal pole of the scaphoid and there's a short screw. And if you think there's a lot of lever arm, you've got the um, FCR tendon there everything distally pulling down on the scaphoid. There's the, there's the distal pole, there's the proximal pole and that's a short screw. So that is not gonna be very stable because these threads are just inside the cancellous bone. That's not as stable as you want it to be. So it's really important, I think, that you remember this is going to flex downwards. So what you want is a long screw. Because if you have a long screw, particularly if you can get the length perfect and pick up the cortex here, then it's much, much more stable. Much, much more stable, particularly for the proximal pole. So use a long screw. If you can, get cortex each side. It's difficult to get the length right, but you can. Now, the other thing is when you have a really proximal pole fracture, like this one on the left here, really proximal pole, if you put in a big threaded compression screw, like we saw just now, there's no biology left because you'll fill that proximal pole with screw. And also you can actually break the proximal pole because the screw is so big relative to the bone. So you don't want to do that. And for these very, very proximal poles, I tend to use a a uh, simple thin screw. As you can see, I do it very, very long. And I've picked up the cortex on that supinated oblique view, a pronated oblique view. You can see the cortex just there. And that's very, very stable. And I've not used up much bone biology. 
I've not compressed it, so I've not broken up this pole. What about K-wise? If you look at the evidence, this is the European Hand Society uh, FESH book from 2017, you can see that actually, if you look at uh, union rates, with K-wise, 92% union, screws, 90% union. And in fact, if you look at vascularized bone graft for that matter, vascularized bone graft and screws, no real difference between vascularized graft and non-vascularized graft. It's all to do with stability. And here's a patient who had a, a big, 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 big gap. And this has been fixed with three very fine K wires rather than a big screw to stop the graft falling out, but also to keep as much pi r squared bone behind to get the bone to heal. Now here's a patient who had a big screw and then didn't heal. And the problem now is, is that you've got a big hole around the screw, you've got a big cavity in the scaphoid. There's not much bone biology left in this person. In fact, that one I fixed by using multiple wires. So because there was a, a big hole, there's no room for another screw, but there's plenty of room to put these fine wires in and lots and lots of bone graft. And this patient healed despite a big hole. So wires are okay. Here's this guy who's healed. And you can see how the wires are here. They're into the lunate to make it as stable as possible and the bone's healed. These are difficult, the tiny, tiny proximal pole like that. Don't do MR scans. You don't need MR scans for scaphoid fractures. Um, there's no evidence that the signal change alters outcome. So there's no point. Um, you can do a CT if you're doing a scaphoid non-union because the CT will help you see where the bone is and where to put your fixation, but there's no need to do an MRI scan. And for the very small proximal poles, I tend to add wires as well to make the thing as stable as I possibly can. So one thing you can do is a scaphocapitate wire because that will stop the scaphoid wobbling. Another thing you can do is uh, radiolunate wires or here scaphalunate wires to make the whole system as stable as you possibly can. This chap here was a fireman and he had a... Um, Tiny, tiny fracture across here, tiny fracture. And we had to get this to heal or his career was finished. And, and there's no vascularized bone graft, but there's a long screw and two wires, a scape capitate wire and a radiolunate wire. So this entire system is stable. And we used Exogen, which is an ultrasound device as well to help get this to heal. And it's all to do with stability. And this guy healed, there he is with the wires out and he's back to work as a fireman. Tiny fracture, no vascularized graft. It was all to do with keeping as much biology as you can, thinnest screw and stability with wires. Now the humpback deformity, if a scaphoid fracture of the waist has been present for a long time, then the distal pole and the proximal pole bend down like this, they bend forwards. We call that a humpback. So instead of being this shape, it bends forwards and the bone at the front here gets lost. It does that. And what you have to do for these is to put a wedge of graft at the front here to hold it out again, like that. So the wedge has to go in the front to open up this humpback. I used to use iliac crest, but I think you can use the distal radius in young people. There's very, very strong distal radius bone here you can use. So we expose the front of the scaphoid. And what I do is here, once I've exposed the scaphoid at the front with an incision, the labrum here has got these very strong ligaments on. You mustn't take all of them off because that can make the joint a bit unstable, but you can lift about three millimeters of ligament just here, either side. It's a bit like a labrum in the shoulder. There's a, the distal radius here has actually got a labrum of, thicker cartilage just at this level and you can release that it gives you a much better view 
And then you put joysticks in because this fracture has collapsed. So to open it up, you put two wires in the back, one here and one here, or in the front here and here, and you open it up like this with the wires. You can see here on the X-ray how the wires are actually bent because I'm pulling it open to open the humpback. There they are closed. There they are open. And you can see the hole here that you've got to fill. And in that hole, you put a wedge of bone. And there's the wedge of bone from the radius uh, or the iliac crest. But one of the problems is with the wedge is that when you, if you then put your screw in and compress, then a bit like this toothpaste tube, as you compress the screw, the graft can push out the front because the graft is a wedge. So as you compress it, it can do this. That's not good. So two things, number one or three things, don't keep compressing, just fix it. Number two, you could use K wires. And number three, when you put your wedge of graft in here, if you just cut a little bit of the edge of the graft out and make it square, then when you compress it, it's less likely to get pushed out. So here's a typical humpback deformity here. And the bone graft has been taken from the radius. It's been stretched open. The tiny screw, remember the smallest possible screw, so you've got lots of biology. And in this one, I put a second wire here because that wire just goes just under the edge of the graft here so that when you put the screw in, it doesn't burst out the front. And that healed. And the final thing for you really is the, is the plate. So a scaphoid plate. Um, this is new technology really. It's been around for a while, um, but just for interest really, but there is a, a plate available for the front of the scaphoid here. And it's very small, it's very thin and it sits in the groove just there. And they're not for every scaphoid fracture, very, very rare, but there are some scaphoid fractures where you have a real problem. And here's one, for example, on the right. This has been fixed. And you, you, you know why that hasn't healed, don't you? Can you see how big that screw is? There's no room for any biology. All you've got is a bit of cortical bone left either side. So that's not healed. And there's a huge hole here at the front and there's a huge hole here. And when you take the screw out, there's very, very little to hold that together. Now you could use wires in a graft, yeah? But this is where a plate may have a role because what you can do with a plate is, instead of fixing it longitudinally, which is our traditional way of thinking, we think go longitudinally, you say, no, 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 let's go, orthogonally, let's go 90 degrees to this problem. Because if you go 90 degrees, you've then got plenty of room to fill the hole with graft and then put the plate on the front, you see, like that. So you could put plenty of bone graft in, but only tiny, tiny screws holding it together. And there's some publications on this. Uh, you can read them up if you like, um, but high union rate using a plate. Why? Because it's stable and because you preserve the biology, pi r squared. You preserve as much surface area of bone as you possibly can. So there's the plate. Um, so I've talked about guide wires. Remember that trick where you put the guide wire over the wrist and you, you, you take an x-ray, then mark it with a pen. And when it's right, that's that you forget that angle, all you need to do is remember the other angle. We talked about screws, use the thinnest screw that you can, use the longest screw that you can, okay? We talked about wires, don't break them when you put them in, careful that the drill doesn't bend them. Remember K wires are useful for scaphoid fractures. Uh, they will heal just as well, maybe better with wires than with a screw. So if you have a difficult fracture and you're in trouble, you think I can't get the screw in, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just put some fine wires in. It'll be good. Those tiny, tiny, tiny pole fractures, they're difficult. My suggestion is you have to go from the back, no bone graft, but you put a tiny, thinnest screw you can and then put other wires in to stabilize the scaphoid so everything's rigid. The humpback where it collapses down, you have to go from the front. K wires to hold it open. Put a graft in from the radius. 
cut the graft a little bit squarer. So you cut the bit of scaphoid out and put a squarer graft in. And then that way you can put your wires or screw in, not too tight to hold it in. And we just mentioned for interest, I don't think you'll get to use, but the plate is another way of thinking of these things in a way that might, might help out. Um, so that, that was the lecture. Here's a textbook that myself and Rod Dunn wrote, the Hamburger Hand Surgery. You can get that on Amazon if you like. Um, it's quite a lot of British Hand Society members uh, helped write this book for us. And the royalties all go to char charity. Um, so we don't keep any money ourselves. It all goes to charity. Um, yeah, that was my lecture on fixing scaphoids for you. Thank you so much, sir. It's my pleasure. Um, so we can come back to stop the screen share, I think. There we go, and we're all back here. Now we come to the questions. Uh, yeah. May I ask a question uh, myself, sir? Of course you can. One of our colleagues was uh, performing a percutaneous uh, screw, uh, percutaneous wiring and the percutaneous screw and a uh, bone marrow injection. What, what do you think about this technique, sir? Not grafting, uh, yeah, just bone marrow injection. Yeah, no, I think there's, it's all to do with biology, isn't it? And uh, yeah. if you put BMP in um, from bone marrow, I think as long as everything's stable, that's the key thing. But it must make sense. There have been some studies where they tried commercial BMP. Yeah. Uh, and I think there were some problems. I think there was too much bone formation in some patients. Uh, it was too biological. Yeah. But the principle, I guess, like all these things, you know, it needs to have a study done to prove it, a randomized study or something. Um, but yeah, maybe it's not a bad idea. As long as the fixation's stable, I think that's the main thing. Dr. Rami, uh, you will moderate the questions, Dr. Rami. You are muted. Do you hear me now? Hear you now. Yes, perfect. Prof. Uh, Warwick, I, I know you, you, you are treating many athletes. So yeah. in your office right now, a football player with his coach, and the coach is telling you this football player had a fall out to stretch his hand with a scaphoid on this place the fracture. Do you plan this patient, do you plan the management of this patient differently or you will stick to the same rules? Well, that's a good question. So um, the answer to your question is that my rule for all patients is that I don't choose this, the treatment the patient does. So my job is just to tell the patient, this is your problem and we can help you do this, this, this or this. Um, now, a lot of athletes will choose to have percutaneous fixation because with a percutaneous screw, if you do it properly and it doesn't go wrong, then with a percutaneous screw, uh, they don't need a plaster cast. Uh, you can get moving straight away. And um, for, for those people, they can get back to play usually a lot earlier particularly if you're an outfield player because you could you could put that in and just for the game just have a light splint on because outfield players you know they push around and um but you haven't got a plaster cast which will probably stop you playing um so i offer that to patients but um if you're a dentist or a surgeon uh or lots of people you say look if i make a percutaneous fixation there's no plaster cast uh you can get back to work as a dentist probably within an uh, 10 days or a surgeon back to work 10 days whereas with a plaster cast six weeks eight weeks so you have to tell the patient this but you also have to tell them that if i do an operation five percent of operations can go badly wrong doesn't matter if you're a good surgeon brilliant surgeon things happen you can get an infection you, you put the screw in it doesn't quite thing or the too long or um distraction oh you things happen and and so you know when we do surgery you, you the patient has to understand for any operation we do that there are choices and there are some risks so i always warn patients um that there's a risk but certainly there is a role i think for percutaneous scaphoid fixation for people who understand that you can probably get them back to work earlier in certain occupations if you if your job is building roads 
you know, heavy, heavy, heavy. A percutase fixation, you, you, you still can't go to heavy work for six weeks. The bone's got to heal. But for very light, gentle work, maybe you can get back to work a little bit quicker. So for athletes, uh, yeah, it, it's not uncommon to fix them because they need to get back to work, to training as quickly as possible. Perfect. Thank you very much. There is also one question about discharge criteria of patients treated with conservative treatment. Uh, yeah. How how do you sign them off? Is it tenderness or is it X-ray finding? Oh, well, that's a good what question. Is- yeah. So, if you've treated people conservative, which, which we mostly do, we don't fix everybody. For, certainly not. But but people who choose fix it. But if you want to know a scaphoid is fixed and healed, sometimes it's difficult. And it's the same problem you have when you have an acute fracture. We all know we've all missed acute fractures in casualty. And one of the reasons is, is the scaphoid breaks very, very cleanly like this. So if that's the fracture line there, try to get my, my picture there. It's a very sharp break, isn't it? And if you, if you break the scaphoid like this and you take an X-ray with just a little bit of parallax, just like that, guess what? You can't see the fracture. There's the fracture like that. You can't see the fracture. And I think the reason that we miss them in the casualty department is, well, we don't examine people properly. That's bad. But even if you take a simple x-ray, you miss it, which is why we do this view and this view and this view. To try, all we're trying to do is you hope one of those x-rays picks up the parallax. That's all. And I think it's the same when you are they healed or not, you have the same problem. You've got a bone that's healed. Like that, it looks healed. Like that, there's a non-union. So I think you have to definitely do physical examination, for sure, quite rigidly. And I think you have to do proper scaphoid x-rays, five views. And if you have any doubt, or if your patient's very rich, then a CT scan is the way to be sure. Because... Not everyone can afford a CT. It's a lot of radiation and everything else. But if it was me, I think I'd probably, I'd do some x-rays maybe, but actually a CT scan, it doesn't matter about parallax. Who cares? A CT scan, um, I think, is the perfect answer. But you can't afford to CTs. I can't afford CTs for everybody. And there is a radiation dose, which, which can be an issue. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, about non-union and delayed union, uh, is it just a time frame uh, when you say to the patient, no, you are going to non-union, we need to surgery and attack your scaphoid? Wow. That, good questions tonight. Very good question, that one. So I think this is the same question in all of orthopedics, isn't it? Because everything is, is a spectrum. Delayed union means that one day it will unite. Non-union means it has not united. But the trouble is you don't know which ones won't unite. So I think there are some clues which you need to be aware of. So we do know that any scaphoid fracture, if you treat it early enough in a plaster, will probably heal, but not all. So if they're displaced and really displaced at the beginning, and sometimes you're not sure unless you do a CT, then it's much more difficult for a displaced fracture to heal, obviously. There are other fractures which seem fine and you put them in plaster and at four weeks and they're fine. Six weeks, yeah, it's not healed. Eight weeks, it's not healed, but it's just starting to either make a cavity in the middle or it's just starting to do the humpback, you know, like this, the bone. And you have to watch these because if you keep them in plaster and they haven't got a cavity or they haven't collapsed in a plaster for eight 12, 16 weeks, then they'll probably heal, most will. But if you have the clue earlier that they're doing this or cavity forming, then you probably now need to say to the patient, you know what, I think we should fix this. And we do know that for those patients, if you get them early before they do the humpback or before the cavity gets too big, just percutaneous fixation is enough without the bone graft early because the, the, the drilling, I think, makes, kicks the biology, like, like gasoline, you know, drilling. Um, 
And guess what? It's stable. You've made the bone stable and it starts to heal. So it's a very good question because you could have a non-union where it's a humpback and it's displaced or it's a proximal pole and there's necrosis. That's non-union. That's kind of hard. But the, the good question is delayed union. How long do you use the plaster before you, you then put the screw and maybe eight to 10 weeks, you can start to see clues sometimes that it's not working. Perfect, thank you very much. There is a question about the proximal pool fracture. It is always tricky, but when do you say, no, your fracture is too small, I'm not going to fix it, I will take it off. Yeah, now that's a difficult question too. Um, because what attaches to the proximal pole of the scaphoid scaphalunate ligament and some tiny proximal pole fractures are maybe all proximal pole fractures are actually avulsions of the scaphalunate ligament so i think the risk might be if it's a small fragment if you take the small fragment out that you then have an unstable scaphalunate ligament so i think that's a difficult question actually um if it's a small fragment then they may have no symptoms, leave it. If it's big enough, then maybe try and fix it. Um, but to excise the fragment, you need to be careful that you don't make a scaphalunate ligament injury because then you just swapped a painful non-union that's still stable because the scaphalunate ligament, the bone is still attached, but you take it out and then suddenly it's unstable. So I think that's a very, very difficult problem is the answer. I have a question, sir, please. From your uh, very long experience, sir, what do you think about, sir, the uh, vascularized metacarpal grafts based on the retinacular arteries for uh, non-united scaphoid? Do you prefer it or not, sir? So, so vascularized grafting is... Um, I've not done many because the evidence is, is that you don't necessarily need a vascularized graft as long as you have stability and enough... Of your own biology the other thing is, is these very the ones that might what, apparently need a graph because of avn the very very proximal pole ones over here actually it's very very hard you can't get them from the front from the back you the zardenberg graph which comes from the radius here doesn't reach this far you can use different ones so it's actually very hard to get the graft in and also if you make a hole big enough to put the graft in the proximal pole there's no proximal pole left. So the irony is, is that really, really tiny ones, it's very hard to get a graft into it. And if they're a bit further along, then I think with stability and non-vascularized graft, most of these you can get to heal is the answer. Most of you get to heal. The second question from me, sir, when do you, do you decide to excise the proximal pole? Do you sometimes excise the proximal pool? Um, Yeah, we talked about that just now, but very rarely because of the risk of a scapholunate ligament problem afterwards. Um, because if you take that proximal pole out, then the lunate and the scaphoid have no contact between them. And that's a danger. So I try not to, I try and fix them unless they're really, really small, really, really small. And if they're really small, then to try and shell them out uh, and leave the scaphalunate ligament, if it can, attached to the bone. Thank you, sir. Rami? Uh, there is a question about lunate morphology. It is known that there is type 1 and type 2. For the type 2, it is more likely to progress to non-union. Do you manage this patient differently or same management for both types of lunate morphology? Is that of the lunate or the, the scaphoid type? Lunate. I, I didn't know that. Lunate morphology. morphology. There is a paper from Hein 2020 from Duke University. And yes. About the lunate morphology, and they have classified as type 1 and type 2. And the yeah. conclusion of this study is that type 2 is more likely to progress to non union. Okay, to non union of the scaphoid. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that actually. That's a new paper for me, I'm afraid. <laughs> There is a question from Mr. Uh, Korani uh, about a patient had a non-union with a vascular necrosis 
how do you attack them uh, this injury? So non-union with avascular necrosis is interesting. So um, what is avascular necrosis? Um, I've never quite understood because when the proximal pole is white, that white is calcium. So how does the calcium get there if the bone is dead? So I, I, that's difficult, isn't it? The proximal pole, which is necrotic, uh, may still heal with uh, stability and a bone graft. A vascularized bone graft is an option, but again, technically, it's very difficult to get a vascularized graft this far proximal. Um, there are some clever surgeons, much cleverer than I am, who do uh, free grafts, for example, using the medial femoral condyle as a free flap. Uh, that's very clever. Um, so that's something else to think about. If it's a truly necrotic part of the scaphoid is to have a vascularized free flap graft. I have never done that, never will. Okay, uh, there is a question from Mr. Mustafa Rawi uh, about revision of failed grafts in scaphoid non-union. So if this is a case, scaphoid non-union, you have put a graft. What is your time frame before asking the patient for another surgery? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think if, if it's clearly not healed, then the patient will want to have further surgery. So it may be obvious after four weeks, if the fixation has fallen to bits because your screw was in the wrong place or something, that's failed. It may be that six months later, you've watched it, you've watched it. And it's a, there's a group of people with proximal pole fractures that you fixed who the bone never heals as a group. But you take an x-ray at one year, two year, three years, and there's no resorption, nothing's changed, they've got no pain, and they've got a strong fibrous union. You've got a, a screw that, that's cortex to cortex, there's a strong fibrous union, and they've got no symptoms. And I wouldn't treat an asymptomatic non-union. Um, I would say, look, there's fibrous, the combination of the screw, or the wires if you left the wires in, the combination of the wires and the screw, and the fibrous scar, it's stable, there's no pain. So I wouldn't treat them if they had no symptoms. But if it's falling to bits, then it's difficult surgery. And that's when we're talking about multiple wires, we're talking about a scaphoid plate. Um, and for some people, we say, look, your scaphoid's finished, we can't help you, it's, it's done, we cannot mend it for you. And then with proxima row carpectomy, four corner fusion, salvage operation okay, so um, a question about uh, again the football football player and his coach came back to your clinic after fixing uh, the scaphoid so and you did x-ray so i i think you are heading to non-union go do mri scan or poor scan or ct scan and come back to me what is your choice um i don't use an mri scan um because it won't change my management uh, if I'm thinking of doing surgery for a non-union, then I usually have a CT scan because that tells me, has it done the humpback? If it's a proximal pole, it tells me how big it is because it's sometimes on the x-ray, you can't tell if that's the proximal pole here, it looks quite big, but if you do that, it looks quite small on the x-ray. So I often do a CT and that's purely to help me understand where I'm going to fix it. I don't do an MRI scan because it doesn't make any difference if it's vascular or not. It, it makes no difference to what you're going to do. Um, so no. Yeah, most of the fractures are transverse. Do you have any tricks for longitudinal or oblique fractures of the scaphoid? Hmm. Well, I think they're more likely to be displaced if they're if they're if they're oblique because the fracture will, will will slip. So I think they're more likely to need surgery. Sometimes you can't fix them percutaneously because they've displaced and you do have to open them, reduce them and then fix them. So oblique fractures are more likely to displace and therefore more likely not to heal. In such cases, you prefer plate or just a screw? No, no, uh, usually wires or a screw. The, the plate is very rarely used. I think the plate is difficult. And when you put them on here, um, it's quite small. 
it's smaller than you think. It's here. So there's a high chance as you come forwards, the plate hits the radius. So they often need to be removed. Um, so for me, the plate is for those very difficult fractures where they've already lost, had a previous operation, they've lost quite a lot of bone, and you just need to change your mind from longitudinal fixation to, to a sort of perpendicular fixation. Thank you very much. Uh, Rufat Ashab, do you have any questions? No, thank you so much, sir. This uh, you prefer to go to the third presentation or that's good tonight? Well, I think we've done enough because I think okay. hopefully I've, I've, I've sort of, we've had so much to talk about tonight yeah. and I think it'd be quite nice for every, there's a hundred people listening, which is absolute honour for me, a hundred people. No, no, no. We, we, we don't want to leave you, sir, tonight, <laughs> but it's a great honour for us. Thank you so much uh, for being with us tonight and for sharing with us your very long experience. It's my pleasure. I've got... Um, as I say, I love the Egyptian people. I've, 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 yeah, I do. I, I've really enjoyed the Egyptian people I've ever met. So um, for me, this is a complete honour. And uh, what I suggest is, is that if you need a speaker in a in a in the future, I've got other lectures for you. I, I sent a list to um, Rami, uh, and um, so you know, I'm very happy to give one or two more lectures if you ever want me to. Just ask, and I'll. Yeah, of I'll course, of course, it's yeah. a, it's a great honour for us to be with us again, sir. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I hope you've all learned something. And um, yeah, let's hope we all meet again when this horrible COVID thing's finished. We hope so. <laughs> Everybody stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.